provide the filter and the process, then you can do whatever kind of algorithm you can think that falls in this area of problems, the graph mining. And uh, we're, I think this is just the beginning for us. We are working on an extension of Arabesque. For instance, as I said, not all problems are tractable. So we have to be able to do something on this front. And we are trying to add sampling, for instance, in order to be able to speed up and go to depth that we cannot reach uh, when you are doing one by one. And we, again, we want to put this in the system. So you don't have to care about this. The system will be able to, to do this and provide statistical guarantees that the outcome is not some just to notice. And uh, with this, I conclude. Thanks a lot for your attention. And let me know questions. The number of the workers. Yes. How do you decide? Uh, it's based on your cluster. If you have, uh, if you have 32 machines, you can put it. First of all, it's the cluster, and what's the Hadoop configuration? So the way we set up Hadoop, because we only use it for our best is we have one worker per machine, and then this worker uses all the threads. So if you have a cluster of 10 machines, you put 10 workers. If you have a cluster of 64 machines, you put 64. Uh, about the your architecture, somewhere you uh, told about the load balancer. Mm -hmm. But uh, we uh, you uh, didn't show us what is the role of the load balancing in the system. So the way we do it is like we try to spread the embeddings uniform across all workers and all all threads. That's how we we try to achieve load balancing. Okay, by just splitting everything randomly. And we don't have a, a different way, and we assume it will work. If it doesn't work, then we have to implement something else. But so far, we we saw that it actually does work. We didn't have this problem. Okay. About discarding the uh, identical embeddings, um, you use some ordering for that. But wouldn't it be possible to d discard a valid embedding as found earlier by a worker than the other one? So the so thing is, like, can you repeat the question for the recording? Uh, so, if I understand correctly, you say, like, is it possible to discard something? Uh, worker 1 will discard it before worker 2 finds Actually this kind of event. Yeah. So, be because we're using a parallel <coughs> parallel model and everything happens uh, on steps, then worker 1 and worker 2 will do the same work at the same step because you go from depth 2 to depth 3. So, yes, like it will be on this step. It might be some seconds before or after, it doesn't really matter. Okay. Only, only one value will be processed. Okay, thank you. So it's basically just a simple. <laughs> so how does uh, how does the quick pattern how does the quick pattern work? Okay. So we don't really care of uh, doing any fancy computation. We just scan the pattern and we assign like you somehow have to assign IDs. It's like the first uh, the first label get ID one, the second label based following on, on the edges get ID two, etc. Just a linear scan. It's nothing complicated. That's why it can happen so fast. But then this will have will generate more patterns because you generate both red, blue, and blue red. And then you have to decide that one only one of them is the the in the order they will appear in every embedding. So you have, let's say, three embeddings, the two of them have red, blue, and one has blue, red. We're going to have two. And then we're using the two as what is the conversion order to the and the canonical pattern. Yes? Uh, so in FSM, uh, you, have, you have two different settings. So you talked about single class setting, but there is also the conventional setting where you want to find uh, common subclass. Can you repeat? Because now, now I've been clear. Okay, so in, in frequent subclass mining, uh, there are two uh, <coughs> disciplines uh, finding frequent subclass in a single graph, which you described, and yes. finding frequent subclass in a collection of graphs. Yes. Uh, is, is it possible to apply uh, our best? So the, to the, the question is that. FSM can be applied on a single graph and on multiple graphs. So the thing is that for multiple graphs, it's a little bit different the problem. Yeah. But I think we just, I think we can. Actually, I'm not sure if we can do it or not. Probably we can do it. Yeah. <laughs> and it's it's a little bit different. So yeah. you need to know which graph they belong. So because like then you go and say the support there means that if you have 
five uh, graphs, let's say, and you have support two, that means this pattern needs to appear in two of these graphs. So it's a little bit different, the problem. But uh, I don't know, maybe. Maybe we, we can talk about it because we are, we are, we are doing a G span. The, uh, yes, and it's G span that okay, basically. Yes, because we are building that on Flink, uh -huh. and maybe we can talk about it. Yes, we can talk. Uh, cool. Yes. No, we don't do anything for nothing. It's basically just the way we do it is like we want to subload the embeddings across all the cluster in order to avoid hotspots. And we're assuming by just randomly spreading them everywhere, but we are not gonna have hotspots. That's the policy. But there is no preprocessing involved in the manage support. So so basically, this or that structure that it's compute, then it gets aggregated, okay, hierarchically in order for performance, and then it's broadcasted to all the machines. And but this is just a limitation of the current implementation we are doing. We don't like it. so this involved a lot of a lot of things to do, a lot of components in order to build. So it's like on this first incarnation, we assume that the graph fits in one machine. So all the workers load the same graph and the attacks are broadcasted. None of them needs to be there, we just did it for communities. We just need to think a little bit different, bro. Have you got any um, use outside of the university in this project? Like so the implementation? For, so the question is if we have applications for people using it just right now, you mean? What, just examples? Uh, the only one that I know is myself that we are using it for sports analytics, for football data. That's the whole reason of the presentation and uh, <laughs> try to convince people that it's a cool system to use. Right. So basically what we are doing is doing trajectory sublinks for football players. And uh, yeah, we have discussed some issues we need to fix that. <laughs> Any more questions? I have a question. Um, when you filter embeddings, but it turns actually later out that they would have been a valid embedding. So you cannot, in a previous step, it's not yet valid, but you filter it out because it's not yet valid, but then in the kind of next expansion. So that, that, that's the, the trick I said, that this, we, we assume the, the, the requirement is anti-monotonicity, so that, that this cannot be you. Okay. So the filtering should, has this kind of property of the anti-monotonicity. That's why if you count frequency, you basically have to use, let's say, to completely explain, but you cannot just say, oh, I found six embeddings, so that would be the sixth number. You have to do something else. It's called the minimum support image. And there are a number of uh, ways of uh, doing this kind of frequency counting. Uh, in the literature, we just use uh, one of them. But you need to have this property, because if this breaks, then we can provide no guarantee of correctness, etc. While well, now, we provide uh, everything is going to be correct. Yes? Are you planning to develop this further and maybe like contribute it to another project? Or like, uh, because how I see people most of you would like to like to use it as, uh, with some kind of like Python notebook or something that, where they don't have to write the program and do quick exploration. So the, the question is if we plan to further develop it and make it more user friendly, maybe put it inside the Python uh, their book, etc. Yes, but <laughs> in a sense like this, as Max Hans Frank said before in the previous presentation, this is a research open source project, okay? So uh, if I'm designed to spend my time, I will put it 80% to go for, like for instance, how we can do sets on top of Arabesque or how we're going to do sampling, and then put 20% how to make it uh, more easy for users to use it. I mean, I think it's pretty easy to use, but of course it's not on the level of Python, etc. It's not out of the question, but right now, honestly, it's not that someone is working on it. Any more questions? Uh, did you also apply to kind of property-based graphs so that you kind of transform properties into labels? And then yes. So well, we haven't released the code yet. We were thinking of how to do it because it's not that we will allow, for instance, load RDF graphs, present to convert them to property graphs. But that's why. We support now uh, labels on edges, and that's why we can have multiple edges between two practices in order to exactly support property graphs. We actually support multiple edges per vertex, yes. so the different vertex one and two can be multiple in order to have the different edges. Any other questions? Otherwise, okay, thanks a lot. Thank you. Uh, in the next one.
talk, uh, Martin will actually speak about uh, Ragu, which is a, a system that user utilizes for things like that, but graph polarization frequency of combining on multi graphs, not just on single graphs. So it's really cool stuff. Ik 
niet je schouder dood van dit is als ik denk je erover na. Ja. Ik denk dat het meteen anders voelt. Maar ja, ik ben met de huizen te bezig en nooit te Iets leer ik meer over Jay dan ik van. Ook kan ik niet iets over zeggen. Ik heb een raadbaar gehoord. Ik wil een beetje een beetje een beetje een beetje Some more people coming in, so let's wait for a second until everyone. Oh, I should. 
have to take a bit open and close. Okay, and yeah. welcome everyone. I'm really excited to have Martin speak about Gradoop here. I saw the presentation before, or a very good presentation before. And I especially like uh, kind of the extension of the company graph model. Uh, we have kind of the back graph concept, and then all these kind of multi graph operations that you can do, like FSM model and multi graphs and so on. And uh, so, welcome Martin, and I'm looking forward to your course. Uh, 
you must be handle, uh, you must be capable of handling multiple graphs, collections of graphs, because uh, the result of the community detection algorithm, for example, is essentially not a single graph, but it's multiple graphs, your communities. Or uh, in another example, the, uh, the application of pattern matching, for example, just leads to a collection of graphs, which are the embeddings of your pattern. Then you need to apply um, filtering, uh, like for example, you need to, to aggregate those communities. We wanted to know how many vertices are in there, so we need to aggregate them in some kind of way. And then we need to select uh, just a subset of those collections. <coughs> and then, of course, we have to apply dedicated algorithms to um, find the, the uh, for example, in that case, the common subgraph. So, and let's not forget, uh, graphs are very large. So uh, we thought we should implement this on a distributed system um, in, in terms of scalability. So and what is Kradoop? Kradoop is a framework and for us, of course, uh, a research platform for the efficient distributed and domain independent graph data management. So it's also about storing graphs um, and analytics. Yeah, and today I will uh, talk about the analytical part of Kradoop. Um, this is the high level architecture um, at the moment. So we, we build on top of um, HDFS YARN cluster. We use HBase for uh, storing our distributed graph. Um, and we use Apache Flink for the implementation of our operators. So Kradoop itself is uh, just sitting on top of Flink and a bit on top of HBase. It's written in Java um, 7 to be exact, and it's about 25 a lines of code and 33 including tests. And it's GBL licensed and you can uh, uh, use it on GitHub. Okay, let's talk about the data model. I guess uh, many of you are familiar with the property graph model. I am, many more, okay. And so, this is property, uh, the property graph model is uh, used in many graph databases, for example, Neo4j, and has uh, been widely accepted in industry and also in academia. And so we thought it's maybe a good idea to just use that model and extend it, because it's really good for storing heterogeneous data. So what we have here is a set of notices, which are, for example, texts, um, forums, and uh, some persons. And those notices um, have a unique ID, which you can see here. They have uh, a label and they have a set of uh, key value properties. We don't have a schema here, so uh, just that if, if a vertex has, for example, the label person, doesn't mean it has to have a given set of uh, properties. Uh, the writing you can see here that um, Alice, for example, has different properties than um, Frank. Of course, those vertices are connected by edges. Edges are binary, which means they connect at most two vertices. They are directed, they also have a unique identifier, and they have a label. And they can have properties um, like here um, to yeah, further describe this relationship. So the concept, um, so this is what the, extent, uh, the property graph model is. And the simple co uh, concept we added is uh, the concept of so-called logical graphs. Logical graphs are just subgraphs of your um, property graph, uh, which can also be labeled, um, have properties, and have a unique ID. And those subgraphs can be used to, for example, describe your communities as a result of label propagation or of a community detection algorithm. Or you can just say, in that case, we have two communities. For example, these three users are either interested in the tech databases or are interested uh, of a member of a forum which has a tech database. So this is a database community. And this could also be the result of a pattern matching, for example. So these are maybe two embeddings of a pattern. Uh, which has been stated by the uh, user. Uh, we call them logical graph because they are just uh, a, a layer above the graph and they, they don't uh, store redundant uh, vertices, they just share vertices, which you can see perfectly here. So those graphs can also overlap. Like for example, Alice is now in two uh, logical graphs, uh, that one with ID 2 and that one with ID 0. And as logical graphs uh, are part of the data model, we can also apply operations or yeah, operators on logical graphs and on collections of logical graphs. So, those is an overview of our um, operators. Uh, let me introduce the table first. So, we have um, four categories. We have uh, unary operators, which are applied, for example, on a single logical graph, yeah, like one graph. Uh, we have uh, unary operators that are applied on a graph collection. A graph collection is just a tuple of graphs, which means they are ordered and logical graphs can um, be contained multiple times inside the graph collection. And we have binary operators, which take, yeah, like the name says, two logical graphs or two graph collections as input. And we also have a set of uh, algorithms, which I will talk about later. So for example, we have um, binary logical graph operators. Those are very simple from a conceptual point of view. 
you just uh, have something like combination. You have two logical graphs, and you want to combine them, and you have a new logical graph containing all the vertices and edges from both uh, input graphs. Same goes with overlap. You want to just uh, have those vertices and edges which are contained in both graphs. Um, exclusion is uh, intersections, and which is a very nice uh, operator in the system is equality. So you can compare two graphs. You can say if they are equal or not. We have two implementations of equality. One that really works uh, that works on the identifiers. So if it's really the same objects inside uh, two graphs, and we have an implementation that works with canonical labeling, which means that we compare two graphs uh, based on the attributes. Um, of the vertices and edges contained in that graph, which is very, uh, in, in very interesting operator. Let me show you an example. Um, what I have here is just a, I call it pseudo code. I will show you later some real code uh, of the implementation, uh, but it's better readable. So, um, what we do here is we have um, our DB, which is our database graph, so the, the whole system, and we select the logical graph with ID 0 uh, using just the G, and this is the collection and the ID. And we say, okay, take that graph, combine it with graph ID 1, and combine that result with graph ID 2, which means the result would be a single new logical graph, you see that here, that it has a new ID, containing all vertices and edges that are uh, in the input graphs. Okay, it's uh, really simple. Uh, more interesting operators are in the second category, the lunar logical graph operators. So we have things here like aggregation. Aggregation can be used uh, to compute an aggregate value on your graph and store the result of your aggregate as a new property at the graph, front of the graph. Which means you can, for example, count the vertices and store the result of that count as a new <coughs> property on your logical graph. Pattern matching, uh, subgraph isomorphism, as anyone uh, knows. Transformation. Uh, this is uh, an in-place transformation, which means you can uh, you cannot change the structure of a graph, but you can uh, change the properties and labels at the graph, at the vertices, or at the edges. Grouping, uh, I will show you an example how this works. And subgraph to um, uh, determine subgraphs contained in your logic graph, which result also in a new graph. Um, we can um, yeah we support vertex induced, edge induced subgraphs, and of course uh, normal subgraphs. Okay, let me give you an example for grouping. Grouping is a very interesting operator and um, it's uh, quite familiar. Or if you're familiar with SQL grouping, then uh, this should be easy to understand. Uh, what we do here is the user um, just says, okay, we have some grouping keys. In our case, for the vertices, we have the label as a grouping key and the property key city as a grouping key. And for the edges, it's just the label. So what we want to do here is we want to group our graph uh, based on the values uh, which are associated with those property keys. What we also can um, declare are aggregate functions which are applied on the group vertex, which is uh, called super vertex, and uh, the set of vertices the super vertex represents, and the same goes for edges. In our case, we just want to add a new property to the super vertex, which is uh, the number of vertices represented by that super vertex. Same goes for edges. So in line six, we call this using group by and giving the uh, before uh, uh, the defined um, parameters yeah, to the function. The result would be here, we have users from uh, different cities, Leipzig, Dresden, and Berlin. And the result would be a graph containing three vertices, each vertex representing a single city, and, and an aggregate uh, value, in that case, the number of users uh, which in that case live in the city. Uh, for example, two users, Alice and Bob from Leipzig, three users from Dresden, one user from Berlin. And we also group the edges between the members of those super vertices. So there are um, two, two uh, relations between users which live in the same city, in that case Leipzig, or for example, we have three, uh, three nodes relations from users from Dresden to Leipzig. Uh, this is a very simple example, but uh, this operator can be used for for, for many different things. For example, if you integrate, uh, integrate a graph from a system and you don't know anything about the data which is stored in that graph, you just do a grouping on the labels and what you get essentially is the schema of that graph, um, which is quite uh, interesting and can be used for other um, graph algorithms. Okay, so what you also saw here is that we uh, used combine as the first call and then uh, use the group by operator on the result of the combine, which uh, just shows you that you can um, yeah, compose multiple operators into an analytical program. Uh, what we do now is we just say uh, we want to also know how many edges are contained in our summarized uh, in our group graph, or also called summarized graph. 
um, using an aggregate function, which is in our case just uh, a, a function which takes the graph's input and returns the number of edges in that graph and stores the result of that function as a new property edge count on the resulting graph, which means after that call, uh, the graph would look like this. Okay, this can of course be um, used for filtering uh, a set of logical graphs, uh, logical, a collection of logical graphs. Okay, let's look at um, graph collection operators, which are also unary or binary. I mean, most of them uh, should be known from um, SQL, for example, union intersection difference. Uh, now you know why we have had to rename those. Um, also, equality is the same uh, two implementations. We can compare collection based on the elements contained in the collections, uh, so their identity or their equality in terms of same properties, same label, and so on. Uh, of course, to filter a subset of logical graphs from a graph collection, we have selection, uh, distinct, yeah, sort uh, based on a graph property key, uh, and limit to extract a subset of graphs from a collection. A sub collection would be better group. So, for example, selection, what we do here is uh, we have our graph collection containing three logical graphs, 0, 1, and 2, so the, these three graphs, and we say select and give them a predicate function which just says, okay, uh, evaluate true if the vertex count property has a value which is greater than 3 and the result in that case would uh, be one a collection containing one logical graph uh, in that case the one with ID 2 so like I said before it must be possible um, to apply any kind of uh, graph algorithm in your uh, analytical workflow in your analytical program for that, uh, we have the so-called auxiliary operators. I don't know why this is left out here. Um, it's called call, for example. Uh, with call, you can uh, apply uh, an external algorithm on a logical graph or on a graph collection. For example, uh, we can apply um, uh, algorithms which are uh, available in the Jelly library, which is a graph processing library on Apache Flink. Uh, and apply those algorithms and the result would be, for example, logical graph or graph collection, depending on uh, the algorithm. Uh, frequent subgraphs, uh, you learned about that in the previous talk. So we also have, uh, are working on an implementation of uh, frequent subgraphs on graph collections, which means um, you get a collection as input and you want to uh, get those graphs that contain at least, uh, that have a support of three, which means they must, um, uh, they must contain a pattern. Uh, sorry, I'm a bit confused. Uh, again, so the input is a collection and you want to get those graphs from that collection that um, have support of a given number and the support just says that there must be a pattern which occurs exactly support times in that graph. Okay, um, another uh, auxiliary operator is apply. With apply you can, you can use apply to apply a unary graph operator on a graph collection. So for example, you want to do an aggregation for each graph contained in a graph collection. Reduce is used to apply a binary operator on a graph collection. For example, if you want to combine all graphs in a graph collection, uh, then you use reduce in combination with combination. Okay, let's talk um, about Apache Flink. Uh, does anyone uh, know Apache Flink? Yeah, Spark. Okay, so then even the Spark guys should be familiar with that. So, but I will give you a short introduction. So Apache Flink uh, is essentially